CGTN, China Global Television Network. From Africa's northernmost tip of Tunisia to the southern cape of South Africa and even further west to Nigeria, 2019 has seen political winds blow across many parts of Africa. The year saw both routine and unforeseen transitions of power, with many countries marking new chapters in their leadership. Security has also been a major area of conversation as Africa continues to battle the threat of militant extremism in the Sahel region, the Horn of Africa, as well as recurrent rebel attacks in the Congo. Meanwhile, the reality of climate change continued to dawn with the increasing frequency of extreme weather events in various parts of Africa and the world. But what gains did Africa make in the year that has been? And what lessons is the continent taking into its future? In this episode, we take a look back at the development that shaped Africa in 2019. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Let's broaden this discussion a little bit more now, and I'm joined by a team of analysts to help us run through the politics and security of Africa in 2019. Johnston Chuku is in Lagos. He's the CEO of Kauri Asset Management Limited, an investment bank in Nigeria. Dr. David Monyai, he's in Johannesburg. He's the director for Africa for China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. And with me in studio is Dr. Hassan Haneja. He's the director of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies here in Kenya. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in this discussion and thank you for your time. I want to get a feel from all of you though, because it, 2019 has been quite a, an eventful year. We've seen transitions of power, rapprochement ties and elections. First, uh, Dr. Munyai, let me start off with you. What are the key political moments that you feel had a ripple effect on the continent? I think the continent um, has undergone quite uh, interesting events. Um, firstly, I think there's to do with normal uh, elections that has taken in key countries. And I think these elections we've seen taking place in here in South Africa, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, other uh, countries. But I think what follows the elections was also um, uprisings from the ground. Uh, we saw uh, what was happening in Sudan. Um, Algeria went uh, its own up hills, and uh, there's been lots of changes um, in terms of pushing old uh, dictatorial uh, regimes, uh, yet uh, uh, these countries are still battling to really uh, stabilize uh, both political and economically. Johnson Chukwu, your thoughts? Yeah, well, there are two things that I consider as critical uh, that happened in 2019 in Africa. Uh, like my colleague over there had mentioned the elections, particularly the elections in Nigeria and South Africa. Because of the importance of these countries to regional stability in West Africa and Southern Africa, the fact that the elections we are held successfully was a stabilizing force in Africa. The other thing that happened that should be of great importance to Africans is the coming into effect of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in May, on May 30th, 2019, which will ultimately once the protocol on uh, movement of goods and services are signed, then we could actually have a unified customs zone in Africa, uh, bringing all African, future African countries into a common uh, custom zone. So those are, for me, are the critical defining moments in Africa in 2019. Dr. Haneji, let's get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think three things stood out uh, for me, especially with regard to peace and security on the continent. Um, first of all was uh, the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Remember, they had uh, gone through 20 years of hostility, and I think that sent a powerful message to the world with regard to Africa's ability to uh, make peace with itself, uh, leading to actually the Nobel Peace Prize that we saw uh, Abiy Ahmed receive, and that was a recognition of that. Number two, I think the election in the Congo uh, that led to a peaceful transition of power in Congo is something that was new. You know, Congo hasn't known uh, much of that, actually, for the better part of its independence. And I think perhaps uh, another message that was coming mostly, of course, from the people is sometimes the dissatisfaction that people have, sometimes with uh, the kind of governance or lack of uh, services that we saw leading to the kind of change that we saw in Sudan. And uh, 
the kind of reaction that, of course, then the region uh, experienced. I think it's something helpful. It shows that the continent is growing, and I think uh, 2020 has promises something better. So, gentlemen, continent. we are talking about the major elections that happened on the continent of the two uh, leading economies on the continent. Dr. Munyai, let's start off with the South Africa's election, which happened in May of this year. They set the continent's uh, electoral cycle, but of importance, though, was that the ANC um, uh, seems to have uh, a reduced majority uh, of 57.50%, uh, down from 62.15% in 2014. Decipher what these elections meant for South Africans. Did it change the political outlook of South Africa today? Um, indeed. I think uh, the country had gone through nine years of uh, President uh, Jacob Zuma, um, an, an administration that uh, had quite a lot of crises uh, in terms of governance, bad governance uh, for that matter, uh, in terms of corruption, uh, more specifically, uh, within the state-owned enterprises and a number of other areas uh, where government uh, has a say in terms of management of these uh, businesses. And I think coming of uh, President Ramaphosa, a well-respected um, uh, um, man within uh, his own party and in the country. Uh, he has managed to stabilize the party itself, as well as the country in terms of the fear uh, in, that people had that the national coffers are at mess of corrupt people. I think it's now decreasing. Uh, however, crisis is still deepening in quite a number of uh, areas. Um, we have confronted with uh, a power shortage, um, which is unknown uh, in this country. The biggest uh, power generated company, ESCOM, uh, has had lots of problems. Uh, the South African Airways, SAA, is really battling to keep its uh, flights um, um, in air. And uh, these are some of the problems that South Africa is confronting. There is a capable leadership that is looking into it. However, uh, it is taking time. I think it's an experience that neighboring countries and, and across the continent, that democracy, uh, there's this democracy that we go to elections and tomorrow things will be okay. I mean, this, that seems not to be the case. Uh, something has to happen. I think more pressure needs to be put on um, having good economic policies right. and as well as uh, cooperation among African states. Let's look at the other democratic uh, situation that happened in Nigeria because uh, Johnson, President Buhari retained his seat in that general election in, in Nigeria despite the president's health concerns, despite uh, Boko Haram that seems uh, undefeated, despite promises to eradicate it, and despite the struggling economy where Nigeria was uh, coming out of a recession. Did his victory come as a surprise, though, to Nigerians? I don't think it came as a surprise to Nigerians. Um, if you consider the fact that President Muhammad Buhari has a large followership in the north, he has in previous elections maintained a consistent loyalty of close to 13 million voters. And those voters are not, um, did not bother about the, what happens in the economy or about who is the opposition candidate. They are rapidly loyal to him. And if he contests 100 times, they would vote for him. So for us, uh, if he knew the fact that he had a very strong followership, then it wouldn't have come as a surprise to anybody. What we only saw was a strong contest uh, because the then, uh, vice pre the then presidential candidate of the opposition party was a former vice president and has a strong political um, history. But in terms of voters, uh, President Bugari has a lockdown of about 13 million voters and as long as that remains, it wouldn't be a surprise. Shouldn't be surprising to anybody if he wins any election. The um, supporters of President Buhari are not uh, uh, not bothered about the economy. They um, they love him to uh, to to distraction of the leg. Like they say, like we say. Right, so Dr. Haneja, you talked about uh, the rapprochement of uh, ties between Eritrea and Ethiopia as one of the high points of the continent this year. And, and of course, Ethiopia's Prime Minister, Ahmed Abi, uh, kicked, started a lot of changes in the region. In terms of the Eritrea-Ethiopia uh, relations, though, uh, where are we in terms of the progress on implementation and institutionalizing uh, the ties that were started by President Abiy Ahmed? 
I think the message was sent by Abi Ahmed and uh, Isaiah Safiwaki of Eritrea in making peace was something very positive. But uh, I think there's been uh, s certain challenges with regard to implementation of the peace agreement. Uh, there's certain challenges with regard to establishing you know, joint economic zones, uh, giving away some of the land uh, based on the Algiers agreement you know, t about 20 years ago. And uh, uh, for instance, having the opposition perhaps from uh, the original opposition go back. You know, so some, those are some of the challenges, but I think they're also more attributable to the internal dynamics in Ethiopia because Abi Ahmed has been facing a lot of challenges to try and balance a lot of uh, subnational interests within the country. But uh, uh, by and large, I think uh, where they are is good, and uh, they're going to need a lot of help generally to be able to do that uh, because Eritrea also needs to be, uh, the sanctions to be lifted fully for it to be able to recover economically, to improve with regard to democracy and for Ethiopia to build a strong enough democracy to be able to actually implement the entire peace deal because it's not going to be possible without that. But what impact has this all had all on the region though? There was massive impact. Um, remember that then was also followed by another tripartite agreement between er Eritrea, Djibouti and, and Ethiopia and then other agreements that included even Somalia. And so it has had a massive impact on, on the region, not to mention the kind of efforts that have, we have seen Ethiopia do through Abiy Ahmed in Sudan in trying to bridge, uh, bring about the peace uh, deal between the warring parties, both in uh, North Sudan and in South Sudan. Well, uh, Sudan itself has been a, a point to note during the year. Uh, Dr. Munyai, aside from the elections, though, uh, we have mentioned the situation in Sudan after months of a political crisis. Then Algeria as well had a transition there at the end of the year. Let's start off with the popular uprising in uh, Sudan. What do you make of these developments in Sudan and Algeria be for the continent? I think these are positive movements in terms of uh, removing uh, dictators. Uh, however, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You look at Sudan, um, the military is quite powerful. Uh, the former head of state, I mean, has only been given two years in prison for all the uh, trouble he has caused. And that change, it doesn't differ from what happened in Egypt, uh, where the former dictator came back and uh, the military uh, uh, do take control and uh, dictate what's happening. However, the changes that are taking are very slow. We seem to be getting much more of political movements and uh, quite weak when it comes to economy. And therefore, the trust that people have in democracy, it's weakening. Uh, with each year uh, on, across the continent. There's so much talk about democracy, there's so much elections, and the dividends of democracy are not uh, appearing and not being enjoyed by everyone. Right. Uh, Johnson Shuku, your thoughts on Sudan and uh, Algeria? Um, the basic thing is that um, we've had, uh, Africa has had to contend with a lot of issues uh, in Sudan. Um, I mean, if you cast your mind back to the crisis that we had in um, in uh, Sudan over the past couple of years. But uh, the challenge will actually be from Algeria as it stands today. Because if you look at the North African uh, region, Algeria seems to be the only country that is sliding towards um, uh, some level of instability. Um, we've seen, Ethiopia, um, we've seen um, Egypt. Egypt is actually coming out of the crisis it had. And then we've seen Tunisia also dealing with the crisis it had uh, as a result of the uprising we, we, the, in, a couple of years back. So the concerns would be that if Algeria should slide to any political uncertainty, it could actually uh, expand or affect other North African countries. Uh, but for Sudan, um, Africans have actually had to deal with Sudanese, uh, Sudanese problems for a very long time. And one is hoping that um, the current crisis, um, political crisis, will also um, not degenerate beyond where it is. All right. Uh, Dr. Monyai, we have seen some positives coming out of the DRC, particularly with its, its uh, transition this year. But in terms of security, though, the DRC is still witnessing frequent uh, rebel attacks on, on, the, uh, on civilians there. It's been 20 years of MONUSCO. The, you know, we are hearing talks of uh, MONUSCO now being downsized. Is it time for a change of mandate when it comes to the DRC conflict? Is it time for an exit of MONUSCO altogether? I think the, the combination of the two, I think there is a need for a gradual reduction of the United Nations involvement in the DRC. Um, and in 
return for a strong DRC state. I think what lacks um, in that country is a strong, uh, formidable state that is able to protect its people, its boundaries. Uh, there is a need to really respect the DRC sovereignty and ensure that the region as well as the AU uh, move in to ensure that uh, the entire region operate in a manner that uh, respect human rights as well as the movement of people. What we have uh, in the DRC, it's a quite a complex uh, crisis uh, where people have been moving for centuries from one country to another. And what lacks is infrastructure, lack of uh, business activities, and therefore you have extraction of uh, mineral resources and, and the role played by external powers that really wants to see the conflict continuing for their own benefit. There is a need to uh, ensure that they are all respect uh, the constitution of the DRC, as well as paying tax to enable the state to protect, as well as uh, a, a move in, 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 in building uh, infrastructure for the country. Dr. Khaneji, let me get your thoughts. Al-Shabaab still remains active uh, in, in the Horn of Africa, and we did see in January this year, you know, that Dusit attack in Nairobi. What is going on when it comes to Al-Shabaab on the continent? Is it time to begin exploring an alternative strategy because uh, the, the countries in the region have been having some military interventions? AMISOM and the Somali National Forces have been there for a while now. Uh, Beatrice, you know, uh, in the 21st century, one of the ugly faces of glo globalization has actually been the globalization of terrorism and violent extremism itself, to the extent that uh, ideologies are borrowed, technology is shared, strategies are also adapted, that you do not need to be in Syria to be able to employ the same strategy. Now, al uh, Shabaab is the most formidable uh, terrorist organization in this region. And uh, because of that, it's going to require concerted coordination by the countries concerned, and, but also an em employing both hard, po or rather hard power and soft power, frankly speaking. And Kenya has taken a lead, especially in the use of soft power, especially in countering violent extremism. Uh, to address both the root causes, but also to engage uh, communities in, in a more robust way. You know, outside that, it becomes extremely uh, challenging to defeat either Al Shabaab or Boko Haram, or including ISIS. It's only communities, but also employing a uh, combination of hard and soft power that we're actually going to defeat this threat, uh, perhaps the biggest threat of our time. Johnston, uh, just to come back to your issue with the G5 group and the Sahel region, but also as well uh, regarding Boko Haram. President Buhari in his first term had uh, a pledge to eradicate Boko Haram in 100 days. That has not happened. Is that a question of failed strategy, failing strategy? What is going on in the Sahel region and uh, northern Nigeria? Well, I'll start with the promise. I think that commitment was ba made based on not full understanding of the intricacies of the Boko Haram crisis. A couple of factors are actually made uh, Boko Haram intractable, one of which is the issue of poverty. Until you eradicate poverty or reduce poverty to a reasonable extent, you, you, will not, you cannot eradicate this level of insurgency. And then the second factor is the religious um, affiliation or the religious belief of the, um, those militants, uh, the uh, Boko Haram uh, insurgents. Um, you need to also have a reorientation of that. So when the president made that commitment of 100 days, I think it was based on the not full appreciation of the intricacies or difficulties involved in eradicating Boko Haram. Right, gentlemen, do stay with us. We are going to take a short break now, but to stay tuned, the dialogue continues on Talk Africa in a moment. <laughs> Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now let's delve into another key issue which has featured prominently in Africa in 2019, that of climate change. 
Well, despite successive years of growing calls for mitigation and adaptation, extreme weather events have nonetheless caught the continent off guard, striking at unprecedented record-breaking ferocity. Cyclone Idai, for instance, made landfall in the southern African region, affecting the territories of Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique and Madagascar from March of this year. The United Nations described it as the worst storm to hit the southern hemisphere in recorded history. Entire towns were flooded and the death toll reported to be in excess of 1,300 lives. Drought has also affected various parts of Africa in 2019 with adverse water shortages experienced in South Africa. Zimbabwe has particularly borne the brunt with the world famous Victoria Falls drying down to a trickle. Over 200 elephants have died as a direct result of dry weather since its start in October. It has also been described as the country's worst drought in a century. Unprecedented rains in the eastern African region have also resulted in flooding, claiming many lives and destroying property. Dr. Munyai is still with us, Dr. Hassan Khaneje and Johnston Chuku still with us from Lagos. Dr. Munyai, starting off with you from rising sea levels to floods to drought, uh, the continent has witnessed increased frequency of weather-related climatic uh, situations. We, uh, tropical cyclones, Kenneth and Idai, we are now seeing Zimbabwe having the worst drought in decades. Are African governments really taking the measures uh, to ensure that our climate-related effects are brought under control? Um, yes and no. I think there has been some awareness of uh, climate change. I think um, in Southern Africa, um, the governments are constantly um, dealing with these issues. Uh, but th when it comes to the level of preparedness in, of of this disaster based on the experience of 2019, I think much has to be done. Um, the sad story uh, of climate change in Africa is that the continent is really not uh, part of the problem. Most of the challenges that the continent confront is because of um, um, ill behavior of developed countries that continue to um, the high level of industrialization recklessness in terms of having some of these policies, whether it's United States or in other uh, developed countries. I think they're not coming to the party. They're not uh, behaving in a manner that uh, protects the planet. And right. this will have uh, huge consequences on the continent, particularly in Southern Africa. Let's delve into that, Dr. Khaneja, because uh, as uh, Dr. Monyai puts it, the continent is not part of the problem. Uh, at the recent COP25, uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres himself, expressed uh, disappointment with the results of COP25. He said the world lost an opportunity to tackle the climate uh, crisis. Uh, our African uh, leaders, despite the fact that uh, uh, Af the African continent has not really been part of the problem, but our African leaders offering leadership against the background of what is going on on the continent relating to uh, climate effects. Well, if uh, African leaders uh, are offering leadership, then we're leading from behind. We're not leading from the front, and that, that should change. The challenge, though, is when industrialized economies and uh, Western powers and democracies are reluctant to adopt some of these instruments that uh, they initiated, then it becomes a challenge because most, most of the time they're the biggest polluters. And so uh, when it comes to even carbon emissions in Africa, contributes actually very little to that. And so there are some countries which have been very loud, including Kenya, that holds the United Nations environmental program uh, with regard to uh, ensuring that those emissions are reduced. You know, however, the diplomatic uh, power that these countries have is limited when it gets to uh, those big uh, uh, international forums. And so I think uh, they should keep making noise and the citizens should be sensitized. We are victims of climate change, I think, more than any other part of the world. And so I think uh, the continent should make more noise, but also citizens should be sensitized. For instance, there's massive deforestation around, you know, across the continent. Uh, there's way in which we're using industrial waste or disposing it that is not extremely healthy. And uh, not only does it uh, cause pollution, it actually also contributes to some of those emissions. You know, however, I think in international fora, African countries should be louder uh, to hold the big powers and industrial powers accountable to make sure they actually stick to the deal into, uh, of which themselves initiated. Right. Uh, Johnson Shuku, 
we are seeing countries uh, in the western uh, uh, coastline uh, generally in peril from Mauritania to Cameroon, St. Louis in Senegal is already witnessing rising uh, sea levels. What are countries in that region doing? Well, interestingly, countries in the Sahel region are not doing much. Um, um, but if you look at the entire African continent, I think the only country that is really doing a lot to control the effect of climate change is, Ethiopia, is Ethiopia. Ethiopia had, now has a world record of planting 350 million uh, trees in 12 hours, uh, which is um, today is exceptional, uh, which I believe other African countries should copy. But if you look at the Sahel region, um, you really uh, have to contend with several climate change effects on, this, on that region. You, you, like you rightly pointed out, we're dealing with um, increasing uh, sea level. At the same time, we're also dealing with desert encroachment, and we're dealing with the drying of the uh, ch uh, Chad um, um, basin. So you have three factors coming together to impact negatively on the region as a result of the changes in climate. Unfortunately, countries in, those, in that region are not doing much to curtail any of these uh, effects. Right. Uh, I noticed, uh, Dr. Munyaya, you're agreeing with some points in, in this discussion. What is happening, though, in the South African countries? Are they making any tangible efforts to minimize climatic effects? I think efforts have been taken at SADC level as well as individual countries, including South Africa, I think much is being done in terms of encouraging um, be change of behavior at, at an individual level, as well as ensure that our education system does consider environment as a key issue. And while we're discussing all these things, we should think as Africans that um, we need to think of the new technologies that are coming. We cannot continue talking about um, changing uh, from fuel, fuel um, to, to new technologies without us uh, actively involved in the making of these technologies. We cannot continue buying these expensive technologies uh, from developed countries without our own uh, people, our own universities, uh, really inventing new technologies that deals with this crisis. So we really have a huge challenge that it needs to be handled not just by governments, by individuals at a household level, at individual level. If we look at our seas, uh, the pollution in our seas, at uh, the beaches as we speak, with the holidays, uh, the plastics, I think Rwandan government has done well in terms of banning plastic. I think we need to do the same across the continent. As well as planting trees, a basic uh, issue that in rural areas, uh, people need to be encouraged in urban areas to be encouraged as Ethiopia is doing in terms of planting trees. So this will change the climate uh, that we uh, have at the moment. At, without doing all these um, um, issues, I think we're going to face more uh, damaging uh, climate change in, in, in future. Right. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to wind up now, but I do want to get a comment from all of you. John, uh, Dr. Monia, I'll start off with you because I want to look at Africa in uh, 2020. And if you were to use, uh, to describe one word, use one word to describe Africa, in 2020, what would that be? A bright future. Thank you. Johnson Chukwu? Well, I think Africa will be a continent of great opportunities in 2020. Dr. Haneje? I, I think what I'm looking uh, forward to is a more hopeful continent and a more promising continent. All right. Uh, a lot of optimism uh, from that discussion. And gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us on the program. That's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A special thank you to our panel of analysts for sharing their thoughts and expertise. Johnston Chukwu is in Lagos. He's the CEO of Kauri Asset Management Limited, an investment bank in Nigeria. Dr. David Monyai in Johannesburg is the director for Africa for China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. And with me in Nairobi, Dr. Hassan Haneje, director of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies in Kenya. Now you can reach us on our social media through our Facebook and Twitter handles showing on your screen right now. You can also visit our YouTube playlist and the CGTN Africa website to catch this and past episodes of Talk Africa. Remember to keep the conversation going and see you again next week on Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team in Nairobi, goodbye.